So the topic of our presentation today is titled Backdoor Mule Lottery and Other Security Tales from Gaming. Uh, so the overview of a talk, we'll go through some introductions as first who we are so you get some context, what has happened since 2011 and why that date's important to me is it's the last time I was here speaking at DEF CON about iGaming uh, security issues. Uh, give a brief historical overview of some attacks and how the, 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 the focus has switched from the physical to now more on the logical side. And then probably what's most interesting and what Evan's going to spend a lot of time talking about is uh, the Eddie Tipton case, uh, how we discovered how he rigged a lottery, what Evan did uh, to reverse engineer the code, et cetera. Uh, if time allows, we'll talk a little bit about the recent Russian uh, slot attacks that, uh, you know, they were in Wired magazine recently and, and the report is coming out with another story uh, in a couple weeks. And then we'll try to wrap everything up. So first, one page, uh, one slide about who uh, my company is, since they pay for us, Senate International. Uh, look us up. Always looking to, uh, to, 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 you know, to uh, talk to people. Who I am? My name is Gus Fritchie. I'm a CTO of Senate International. And about five years ago, after our pres after my presentation uh, on iGaming, I transitioned a, a significant portion of our practice into the gaming sector because I just found it more interesting than, than doing the government work uh, that we had been focusing on. And uh, and now I'm pretty proud of, of what we've been able to do and the client base we have going across from lotteries to, tri to tribal casinos, corporate casinos, daily fantasy sports, uh, et cetera. Hey, so I'm Evan. Uh, I work for Gus. Uh, I live in the D. What? Oh. Work with me. Yeah, I work with Gus. Uh, <laughs> so I live in DC. Uh, I have like a Linux distro. It's a small one. I do like reverse engineering and stuff. And uh, in my free time, I hike and climb, and I live in a van too. So here's my van. It's, uh <laughs> but yeah, uh, his. So so Evan limited me to only two memes. So this is uh, this this is one of them. Um, so this is not going to be a, a, a super technical talk, but then again, it's, it's Sunday, the last day of DEF CON. I'm sure we saw there's been a ton of great, highly technical talks. You know, it's more of a story talk, uh, but Evan definitely does get into the details uh, with the code, which I think, you know, those of you who are interested in that subject should, should find pretty interesting. So what has happened since 2011? Um, first, just by a show of hands, how, how many people saw my last one on iGaming security? I was just curious who many who attended. So, a, a handful of people. So, the good news for all of us online poker players is we got paid back our money from the sites that uh, got shut down uh, for the most part. Uh, so, th th that's obviously a good thing. Um, but what we have seen happen is not a lot of movement uh, in iGaming. Uh, the, the, the green illustrates the states where iGaming is legal. So really we only have three, Nevada, uh, Delaware, and New Jersey. Um, and uh, the yellow is pending uh, legislation. Why I find, find this slide interesting is, even though it's a small number, it shows that the attack footprint is expanding. And I think if I don't have a slide, but if I showed a slide of where it shows where land-based casinos are legal, you would also see that expanding. We have tons of states even five years ago that have casinos that didn't used to have casinos. So we see uh, um, you know, the, the attack, potential attack footprint expanding. Is there a question? Oh, what is iGaming? Sorry, iGaming, online poker, online slots, you know, gambling basically online. The, 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 the Caesars and other companies, they like to call it gaming because gambling has a bad, you know, bad sound to it. So this sector has not been immune to security incidents, just like any other sector that, that you read about in the news. You know, I'm not going to talk about any of these uh, in any detail. Um, I just picked a, a, a random sampling of some of the uh, breaches that have been disclosed. And of course, as you know, there, there's plenty of other breaches that occur that, uh, that, that never get disclosed that we don't hear about. Um, so this is obviously uh, an area that you know, needs to be secured. And I think when it comes to you know, the public's, you know, the, the trust and the integrity of gaming uh, is extremely important. So without that, you know, you, you don't really have a solid business model. With the Las Vegas Sands, I do find this, this interesting. This happened in December of 2014. Um, if you didn't read about it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but, it, you know, this occurred to arguably the world's most profitable gaming organization. You know, they make millions and millions of dollars. And at this point in time, uh, where the breach occurred, they had a very small IT security staff. 
I don't have not done any work with Las Vegas Sands, so I can't speak to the you know their size of their staff now. But I understand it's increased a lot, and they put a lot more uh, money uh, into securing those environments. But the way this breach occurred was just to show you how easy it was. It was just a development server that was stood up uh, on the perimeter that they didn't know about or they knew about, but you know it, it was used as a foothold, and then they pivoted inside and they just. You know, ran havoc, uh, destroying uh, data, and it could have been a lot worse if they, uh, you know, were more sophisticated and did not look to be destructive. Um, so history, let's get into some of the early attacks against slot machines. Not going to spend really too much time, so I want Evan to get to his piece, which I think is more interesting. But obviously, in the earlier days, we had you know physical attacks with you know fake coins yo-yoing with a coin on a on a string pulling it back out attacks against the banknote validators uh when those started getting installed um and then we have Tommy Carmichael here who came up with a couple of inventions uh or devices I should say that allowed him to commit fraud with a monkey paw which he was sort of able to use to jam up there and release the the, the coin hopper uh, and then of course with the light wand uh which you know manipulated the sensors and and uh uh, allowed uh, you know the, the money uh, to, to to come out of the machine without being won. So these you know we saw these early attacks were more physical in nature. Um, and another physical attack that we saw that happened in 1980. And uh, my partner in the lottery sector, Herb Delahanty, wrote about this in his book. Um, and it was also made into a movie. Uh, I don't think a very good one, but it, it was there. Um, and they weighted the balls. So you know they weighted the sixes and fours. And, uh, and this obviously was able to happen because you had collusion between multiple parties. Um, I mean, obviously, people realized pretty quickly that it, was, uh, that it was a fraud and no one got paid out. Even the illegal books knew that uh, prior to the lottery even admitting it. So we had these physical attacks uh, against slot machines and other, uh, other forms of gaming. And then we see a transition to attacks on, on the logical uh, side. And I think when you start seeing these stories, you'll start seeing how they tie together to what uh, Eddie Tipton did in the, in the Muscle Hot Lotto uh, RNG fraud case. So uh, some of you may be aware of, uh, of Ron Harris, but he worked for the Nevada Gaming Control Board, and he was, his responsibility was basically to you know, perform audits of the gaming software and, and platforms. And one of the his responsibilities was to audit the EPROMs in the slot machines and make sure that uh, that they were the correct uh, that they were correct. Um, but what he did was instead of auditing them, he reprogrammed them uh, so that uh, when a certain sequence was pushed on the slot machines or a certain number of coins were entered, it would pay out uh, a winnings and. Uh, I spoke to Rex Carlson, who is uh, who was the director of the Nevada Gaming Control Board, and you know he said that they really don't know how much money he actually made from this um, because he really never even had, he didn't get caught initially because of this. He got caught because he turned his attention to Kino, and this is where it sort of parallels what Mr. Tipton did uh, in the Hot Lotto case. Is you know since he had access, of course, to the source code. Uh, he found a flaw in the in the pseudo random number generator, that, and then he wrote a program that allowed him to predict what the winning Kino number was. So he went to uh, Bally's in Atlantic City, and with an accomplice, you know, they won it. I think on the the, the first time uh, that that he played the numbers, and they probably could have got away with it, but they just had such poor planning uh, as far as you know what they were going to do after they won. Uh, so this, of course, raised suspicion, and uh, the authorities performed investigation. Then they went back and looked at the at the at the other work that he was performing. So what we see is we see you know individuals with trust who were trusted to perform these reviews and had access uh, to, to these devices. And this will parallel uh, what happened uh, with Eddie. And one last example from a technical perspective, and I talked about this uh, in my last presentation, but this was from the absolute poker ultimate bet super user scandal, uh, where the owner of the site, I guess I should say alleged, because it was never actually 100% proven, um, but he 
uh, had a convinced one of the programmers that he needed a backdoor into the program so he could see players' whole cards because he thought there was his whole idea was that there was cheating and only he could figure out if they were really cheating. But he proceeded to use use his backdoor in the uh, in the poker software to to illegally win about twenty million dollars uh, from players. And this graph shows the individual, one of the accounts, and you can see that he's way off there as far as the norm from a, from a winning, winning percentage. Um, so once again, we have examples from, uh, from Ron Harris with the Kino, uh, you know, being able to, you know, access the source code and, uh, and find weaknesses. Here we have an example, uh, placing a, another backdoor in a system allowing the, uh, allowing cheat and fraud to occur in the poker. So now I'm going to turn it over to Evan, where he's going to get into the, the, the current events and uh, what I think is the most interesting topic of this uh, talk. All right, cool. So this is my first talk, by the way. Uh, so kind of <laughs> <laughs> So in case you guys aren't familiar with like, uh, how the lottery works, uh, there's individual state lotteries. Uh, and each lottery uh, manages itself. Uh, but there's something called Muscle, which is like an organization that oversees all the state lotteries. Well, most of them. Um, so uh, back in like 2005, was it? Or was it 2004? Uh, it doesn't matter. So like a while back, this guy named Eddie Tipton uh, got a job at Muscle uh, to write an RNG. Uh, so some of the state lotteries use like computer, number, uh, computer RNGs to like draw the numbers. Uh, others use like balls out of hats and stuff like that. Uh, well, not actually hats, but um, yeah. Uh, so he got a job to write an RNG, uh, and pretty much immediately he uh, rigged it uh, because obviously he wanted to make money, um, and they weren't paying him very much. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, here's a couple of other faces involved in this. Uh, Tommy Tipton is like his brother. He was involved in it. He helped cash out tickets. Uh, Robert Rhodes also helped cash out tickets. He was like a friend of his. And then Rob Sand is the uh, attorney general in, in charge of like the case. Uh, all right, so uh, in 2010, uh, Eddie went into a gas station in Iowa and uh, purchased a ticket for a lottery game. Um, he waited a whole year to claim the ticket, which was pretty suspicious. Um, and then uh, also he used a mysterious company uh, incorporated in like Belize and uh, he went through an attorney to try to cash out the ticket. So that was obviously extremely suspicious and uh, lottery security caught wind of that and uh, decided to do an, invest an investigation into it. Um, they also refused to give him the money until like, they completed the investigation uh, and, and because they refused to give the, their identities, which is like, possibly uh, illegal. Um, so they withdrew their uh, claim to the prize because uh, they I'm assuming did not want to get caught. Um, let's see here. And apparently they also received a tip from somebody uh, that tipped in was the person in the video. Uh, actually, I actually think I know who that was, but um, yeah. Um, so they started a full investigation which involved the FBI and stuff too. Um, and they determined that it was him uh, that purchased the ticket. And because he worked for the lottery, he was banned from playing the lottery. Uh, and they kind of used circumstantial evidence to convict him, but they convicted him before they knew how he actually broke the lottery, or that he did for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so he, uh, so he was sentenced to 10 years of prison. Uh, he was out on bond, uh, or bail, pending appeal, uh, for a good, like, year. He actually just pled guilty uh, pretty recently. Um, this should be 2017, but yeah. And here's a quick timeline of events. So he was hired in 2003 at Muscle. And the first known case of fraud was in 2005. Uh, there could have been earlier cases though. Because um, it was written in 2004, right? Yeah. And, so, what, and what's interesting about the timeline here, if, if you look at where it says that the Colorado lottery fraud was co constant lottery fraud, Kansas lottery fraud, do you see a pattern there? Yeah, they're, they're all on the same date. And that's what Evan will talk about when it gets into how his code actually worked and how it allowed him to predict what the winning numbers were going to be. Yeah, and also, uh, this, this is just known cases of fraud. Uh, there were probably be more, um, especially since we found a, a third date uh, in the code itself, which 
uh, there were no known cases of fraud for. Um, so, let's see here. Oh, yeah, you want to No, I just wanted to also, but, uh, a couple gaps just in the, in the story. As Evan mentioned, he was really, he was convicted initially uh, on a charge on really circumstantial evidence. I mean, they had the video footage from the, from the store, uh, which when you, when you think about it, he really made a big mistake because one, he, in, in the other cases of fraud, he actually never bought the tickets himself. He had his accomplices, his brother or Robert Rhodes buying the ticket. But in this case, he actually went and bought the ticket himself. And perhaps that's because the prize value was so large that he just didn't feel comfortable having someone else buy the, buy the winning tickets. And he actually went to a convenience store that had audio and also video surveillance. So there was other stores that he could have gone to that wouldn't have had the video or, or the audio. And it's really the audio was, was, was what convicted him because his voice is very distinctive and they were able to prove it that way. Of course, he felt and his lawyers felt it was circumstantial evidence and they did appeal it. And during that appeal process, uh, that's when we were able to get a hold of the, uh, of the Wisconsin lottery RNG, which Evan will talk about uh, and what he did. But, you know, how do you go about rigging a lottery? And this is my, my second and last meme, so I was, I was only allowed two. Um, but obviously, you become a lottery uh, developer, write code, and have your friends buy the winning numbers. It's, it's that easy. And luckily, for the first time, we have video surveillance of Eddie Tipton actually performing the programming. <laughs> no, 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 now Evan will tell you how he really did it. Yeah, so um, I already kind of went over this part, but um, so basically what he did, uh, he worked for Muscle. Um, the, so not all the lotteries, all the state lotteries use the RNG. Some of them use third-party RNGs, and others use uh, like machines that just like throw balls up in the air and they come back down and stuff like that, which is what lotteries should do, by the way. Uh, should not use computers to generate numbers, but it's better business for us. <laughs> um, so, uh, while he worked there, um, so they have like a supervised build process. Um, so he, had, he got code past that process, uh, which made the numbers predictable in three days uh, with other conditions as well. Um, and the binaries and source code were certified by a major testing lab, but in the way he did it, it wouldn't have mattered uh, unless you really went in depth and uh, checked the binary against the source code and uh, stuff like that. He also had access to uh, the computer images too, which he could have rigged. He could have used like a root kit or something simpler to uh, change the numbers as well. So even if he wasn't the one writing the code, he could have rigged the lottery as well. Um, in 2016, we were contracted to perform imaging of one of the uh, RNGs. Um, and we were actually given permission to review the images uh, at some point, and uh, I was asked to uh, try to figure out how he did it. Because um, at this point, nobody had any idea how he actually did it. Um, he didn't seem smart enough to use a root kit. So uh, when he was convicted, they assumed that he used a root kit to change the numbers, because uh, they didn't find anything in the code. Um, apparently, they didn't find the binary to be uh, malicious in any way. And, um, I, I find it kind of questionable how they analyzed that, but yeah. Um, so I decided that it, since he was the one writing the, R, the, the RNG itself, that I would just look at the binaries and compare them to the code. So I didn't actually have the code initially, so I just started like uh, just going through the uh, binaries and just reverse engineering them. So there were a few binaries, like uh, the main executable, some libraries and stuff like that. Um, so the most interesting binary was the one that actually, uh, inter it actually uh, contained like the RNG itself. Uh, so that was actually the first binary that I looked at, or started looking at. Um, and this is pretty much what I just said. So I was skimming through one of the, all the functions in the binary, and uh, one of them caught my eye pretty much immediately. And at this point, I knew that um, all the winnings, all the known cases of fraud, were on certain dates. So this one, I saw it had a bunch of date functions right at the top. Uh, so I was like, that's probably it. Um, <laughs> Like, I saw another reason for them to use date stuff. So I sort of started, obviously, reverse engineering it. And I saw pretty much immediately that it was referencing those specific dates, uh, the two dates that we knew, and a third date as well. Uh, so I reverse engineered it, and I figured out exactly what it was doing and how it was seeding the RNG and everything like that. Um, so also, it was at the end of the binary, which is pretty suspicious, because it looks like somebody like tacked on that function at the very end of the 
like a file. Um, and eventually we got the source code for the RNG and we saw that there was no, that function wasn't in there. Um, there are 25 functions in the source code and 26 in the binary. Uh, as you can see. But yep. Um, so, uh, yep. That's about it. That's how he did it. Uh, he just, uh, I can go into details on that real quick. Um, so basically each time a number was drawn, this function was called and it would receive the RNG with predictable uh, values um, on certain days of the year. It also had to be like a Wednesday and a, a or a, I think it's supposed to be Sunday, uh, Wednesday or a Sunday. Um, and here's just like the code of uh, his function. And so he actually seeded the RNG off a bunch of values from the computer. I'm not really sure why he did that. He could have used anything really. Uh, he used like the computer name and he like added it up and like uh, threw that into the seed along with like the values from the game and everything. Um, he kind of made it more complicated than necessary, uh, which made him have to buy more tickets than necessary. I guess in some cases he bought multiple tickets because he wasn't sure what the values would be. Um, yeah. And so here's why certification did not work. Uh, so it was, it was certified by one of the major testing labs. Um, and their testing process was to run the output of the, R of the RNG through a bunch of statistical tests, um, which is great to ensure that results are unbiased, but it doesn't really catch anybody reading it. Um, they performed an audit of the source code, uh, but the source code he compiled was obviously different, uh, and he was able to slip that past the supervised build process uh, pretty easily. Uh, so that's questionable. Um, and here's how he could have done it better too. Uh, he worked it on only three days a year, which made it pretty easy to identify the winnings. Um, if you work it on every single day of the year, it'd be extremely difficult to identify the winnings. Because uh, what they did, like what the investigators did, was they knew that he was using like certain dates. Um, so they just went through all those dates and they, they looked at all the winnings. Um, and they looked at the ones that were most suspicious and they followed those as leads. Uh, so obviously if you work the lottery, definitely do every single day of the year. Um, <laughs> and yeah. And also you could have made it, the method of rigging it more discreet. Uh, he could have used a root kit uh, and you know, changed the numbers of memory. Um, and that would have been much more discreet than like having it in the binary. Because uh, what we do now is we check updates to the RNGs uh, and compare them to the source code with like bindiff or if it's in Java, I wrote a custom tool for that. Um, so that we can catch updates, like uh, if anybody uh, tries, to, like, a, like if a vendor tries to like pass a, like a backdoor into like the uh, update, we can catch that uh, pretty easily. Um, so how can this be prevented? Uh, source code should undergo end up third party reviews. Um, the, I think supervised builds are important too. Um, as an additional layer, but for updates, and if you're just like, if you have a binary um, and you're not concerned about the, like, the system image, um, it's pretty easy to check those with like bin diff and make sure they're not malicious after reviewing the source code. Because um, so what we do is we compile the source code and we compare it to like the actual binary you get. Um, but there's another issue with like the, the system image too, where these guys are building this image and that's not supervised at all, so they could, Obviously, slip something in, and uh, it's pretty difficult to supervise that entire process. Uh, and you can't check the image; you can't be certain of finding anything in there. Um, yep, there you are. That's about it. No, thanks, Evan. I think you covered that very well. Um, you know, when you think about it, he actually, you know, had a pretty good idea because you know, once he got this qvrng.dll file in, you know, certified by the testing labs. And, you know, once again, you know, the, the testing labs, you know, supposedly, and I know they do now because we do, you know, review the source code line by line, uh, but, you know, and they were uh, supposed to, you know, you know, watch them compile the codes because they end up hashing those binaries, uh, 
so in some way, we're not completely sure he was able to get the, the testing lab to certify that this code was valid. And then he had it on all these boxes and that never changed. You know, he would make modifications perhaps to QV.exe to the, to the executable, but he never ever had to modify the DLL. So actually what was interesting, uh, when we reviewed some of the more recent muscle RNGs. And you have to remember, he started this process in 2003. You know, he wasn't, this fraud case didn't happen until 2011. He wasn't, you know, convicted uh, until 2015. That's a lot of time going on for him to make modifications. And, uh, you know, as Evan mentioned, there are other commercial RNGs in the lottery sector. Um, but, you know, some of the state lotteries, you know, their whole mission is to give back to education or whatever, you know, uh, uh, whatever, you know, their, uh, is, is written into the law. And, uh, you know, so they're very frugal with their money and they didn't want to, you know, pay, you know, 200,000, whatever for a RNG. So we would pay muscle at a much lower cost. So you had all these RNGs being used in other states. And when we reviewed some of the other ones in, in other states, uh, at least the ones where we could get the images to, you know, it was interesting because the executable was not, uh, was not calling the QVRNG.dll. Uh, correct, Evan? Yeah, I'm a newer one. So somewhere along the line, I think he got scared or nervous, perhaps after his 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 jackpot win, and switched to code. So what? So people wouldn't even look at that QV, QVRNG.dll, and maybe his plan was once things die down, he could just you know call it again uh, in the future. Well, so I think he just I think he left the binary on there uh, when he updated. I think he just left it on there to be honest. Uh, there's been some speculation that he had left it on there to switch back in the future, but I think he just left it on there like when he updated, he never deleted it. Honest. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's different theories for, for, for why he did that. Um, but in the end, I think it's uh, a case of where we see breakdowns in a couple different areas. And probably the most obvious and basic is that the separation of duties. Here you had somebody who was the director of security of Muscle, who was a lead uh, programmer. He had physical access to the boxes. He had everything. And to, to give Muscle credit now, they, they have completely revamped their entire process uh, and their operational management and technical controls are, you know, a hundred times better than they were uh, when this fraud uh, was uh, was committed. So I, I, we can probably definitely go into more detail and talk later uh, about the Tipton case outside. If you guys have specific questions for Evan, like get into the weeds uh, of it. Um, let's just check on time here. Oh, we got plenty of time. Uh, I felt we rushed because I was nervous about the, the video uh, issues in the beginning. Um, so the Russian slot machine hacking, and this sort of ties everything back to the present. We had, we talked about Ron Harris uh, back in the mid 1990s. You know, we have the, the iGaming, uh, the ultimate bet, absolute poker, you know, fraud. We have this Tipton case. And here we have this you know, Russian slot machine hacking, which a very good article, which I'm sure most of you uh, read because it was, it was widely tweeted, uh, at least in my Twitter feed. Um, and I give a, a link to it there. Uh, and also Willie Allison, a World Game Protection Conference, he was also quoted uh, in that article. And, and World Game Protection Conference is a conference here in Vegas in uh, the December timeframe that pretty much focuses on physical security, but he's broadened it, and uh, uh, he has some inside information uh, as far as how this fraud occurred as well. But basically, just to, to rehash the story and, and tie it back in, uh, in 2009, when Putin uh, made uh, gambling illegal uh, in Russia, there was this flood of slot machines on the black market. Um, so the, some of them, or, or a lot of them, you know, were sold to, you know, other casinos, but, but some found their ways into the hands of the Russian mafia. And uh, they ended up reverse engine. Well, I'll get to that piece of it, what they did. But in 2011, some casinos in Europe were noticing some suspicious payouts. And then in 2014 in uh, Missouri, uh, they noticed uh, really unusual and high payouts uh, on some particular slot machines. Um, so they started investigating this, you know, and, and, you know, this is where you have compensated controls and other pieces actually worked to end up detecting the fraud. It was, they had to go back to the, the physical uh, surveillance cameras and uh, tie this all together. Um, but these individuals, they came back and they were later arrested uh, in Missouri. And then some more were arrested in Singapore uh, last year. But what did they do? They reverse engineered, similar to what you know Evan did with the uh, with the code. But they reverse engineered uh, the, the software 
uh, the binary on the, on the slot machines and they found a weakness uh, in the PRNG. Um, so then what they would, uh, what, what the guys would do is they would take a video of a certain number of spins, um, you know, 20, I say 24 there, but it, it varied. Uh, and that, that data was uh, transmitted back to their comrades uh, back in Russia where they were using, uh, you know, very high, uh, high, powerful computers to, to process this data, send it back to them. They had an app on their phone, which would then vibrate uh, a couple seconds uh, milliseconds before they were supposed to hit the button. And it wasn't always successful, but it did result in a much higher payout. Um, and uh, so this is an example where we have a case where there was a weakness in the, uh, in the computer programming in the RNG. This wasn't built on, on purpose. It was just a mistake that the developers made. Um, and uh, this vulnerability you know, uh, impacted a particular vendor, uh, aristocrat, I believe, uh, on their older uh, versions. But uh, the claim now is, and I think not, not to steal uh, the, the reporter's thunder, but that, that they claim to have uh, working code for even modern, more modern uh, slot machines, and they're threatening to release this code uh, to the general public. Uh, they were trying to blackmail aristocrat, I believe, uh, but uh, so far that hasn't worked. But it'll be interesting to read uh, the story uh, when that comes out. So we talked about some issues here in in, in a lot of different uh, different sectors. What can casinos and operators do to better protect themselves? I think it's a lot no different than any other industry, from healthcare to banking. You know, we get caught in this trap of compliance. You know, we got to be compliant. We got to be compliant. We got to be compliant. We waste a lot of money on paper doing that, but we have to understand. And I know I'm preaching to the choir that compliance is not equal security. And uh, you know, when I first got into, you know, working with casinos and other gaming operators. I went in there thinking, wow, these guys are going to be super secure. You know, you, you see all the movies, you know, Ocean's Eleven, they got all this surveillance cameras. And they are very good from a physical perspective for the most part. But, you know, quite honestly, they're, they're, they, they really are lacking uh, in the technical security controls. But that's really no different than, than any other sector. And they're doing a lot more now to... Uh, improve uh, themselves. They're being proactive. I'm working with several. I know other firms are working with them. So they really are taking it uh, to heart to improve their security and protect their players' uh, uh, their players' data. Um, you know, they, more money needs to be spent uh, on information security, and also the operators need to start asking the game manufacturers, what what you, how is your system secure? What controls do you have in place? And you know, I'll give you an example. We were working with a, uh, uh, one of a, a casino organization, and uh, we were doing a, a security assessment, just a basic vulnerability assessment, and uh, realized that from the corporate network, we could actually get to, this, to the slot machines and touch the interface card in the slot machines. And when I brought that up to the director of IT's uh, attention, because I was curious, I was like, should, should you be able to do this? It didn't seem right. He was like, well, let me fire off a note, note to, I'm not going to say the, the, the gaming manufacturer's name. And they came back, oh no, this should, you know, the only thing that needs, these need to talk to is, uh, uh, is, is a player tracking database. You know, it, it doesn't need to, it should be firewalled off. So you have, you know, operate, you know, operators who are trusting their vendors to do the installations and they're not, you know, sometimes not doing it correctly. And then also questioning what other controls do you have in place, you know, uh, as far as the SDLC process, uh, with this code. You know, obviously, you know, these huge organizations, they're not like muscle. They don't have one guy writing the code. Uh, they have hundreds. Uh, but how do we trust that that code is secure? Uh, especially when we're dealing with some, a, a lot of the gaming operators do, you know, a large amount of offshore uh, development. Uh, what are the controls in place? Luckily, we do have gaming regulations uh, with security components. You know, when New Jersey, uh, the second state to, to legalize iGaming, uh, they came out with very, very comprehensive security controls, at least at least more comprehensive than what was in the unregulated industries. If you recall, at that time, there was really no security controls in place. Uh, and, you know, to date, New Jersey is very proud of the fact that they haven't had 
a security incident or a breach or that their controls are working effectively. You know, Maryland, for example, uh, their gaming commission requires their land-based operators to undergo an annual security assessment. Once again, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a step in the right direction to have these security, re- these compliance regulations in place. And then, of course, we have our regular uh, regulatory compliance standards, PCI, et cetera. But as the last bullet says there, often it's left up to the operator to determine the level of security that is implemented. There's not strict guidelines, even when it comes to New Jersey and the testing, it's sort of left up to us working with the operator to determine how deep we dive. And as you can guess, probably a lot of that comes to funding and budget uh, for those operators. So conclusion. While regulated iGaming has added additional controls, you know, there's still room for improvement both on the operators and regulators. And this goes to brick and mortar casinos as well, and also to the, the lottery sector. Um, you know, in my opinion, as I mentioned, I think one of the key risks is in the code. And, and that's what concerns me most, you know, and, and I think this applies to all forms of online, online gambling and also brick and mortar. Uh, I mean, it would be, in my opinion, pretty easy for something to be uh, added to, 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 to one of these iGaming sites that could allow fraud to be committed. It's happened in the past. I think it's going to happen again. And it's very important for the regulators and operators uh, to work together. And, you know, the last point is, as you saw on the slide with the map, you know, while it's still small with iGaming, it's growing. Daily Fantasy Sports is here, as you can't watch, you know, an NFL football game without seeing DraftKings or FanDuel advertising. You know, it's become more widely accepted. You know, sports betting uh, is, uh, uh, looks like, you know, it could become legal in, in other states besides uh, Nevada. Um, you know, no longer is gaming focused on Nevada and Atlantic City. It's across the entire United States. And as it becomes, you know, uh, you know, as it expands, that tax footprint expands and the opportunity expands for crime and fraud to be committed. So that's what we have. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'm sorry for some of the technical delays and we rushed a little bit uh, in the beginning when we probably uh, didn't have to. Um, but we would love to, to speak with any of you uh, outside if you have any specific questions, especially for Evan. I know he went through those code, code slides pretty quickly, but you know, he can definitely go into more detail as far as how that code worked, the various functions, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you for attending and uh, enjoy the last day of DEF CON.